Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. We recently looked at some of the most incompetent and competent military officers within the Galactic Empire's military structure. The natural progression for that series would be for us to now look at the rebel side of the equation. But unfortunately, because the Rebellion would go on to win the Galactic Civil War and control all future information about the war, and so for now, the best thing we can do is take a look at the most competent individuals within the Rebel Alliance. Most of you might remember Antog Merrick as leader of Blue Squadron, who sported a big smile on his way to what essentially was a suicide mission. When half of Blue Squadron entered the atmosphere of Scarif and the shield gate closed behind them, Antog Merrick knew that escaping from the planet would be next to impossible. Yeah, he's still stuck with the mission, which was providing ground support for Rogue One on the ground, but what makes him even more impressive is the fact that he was actually a full-blown general. And not just any general, mind you. He, along with Garvin Dreis, you know, Red One, both left their home planet of Vera Johnson after retiring from the Planetary Defense Force and volunteered for the fledgling Rebel Alliance Starfighter Corps. These two individuals brought experience to a very inexperienced military force, and soon they rose to become leaders of Blue and Red Squadron. Anton Merrick would play a huge part in developing the training doctrine for all future Rebel Alliance starfighter pilots. The General was also a huge part of the reason why the X-Wing, and not the A-Wing, would form the backbone of the Rebel Starfighter Command. Apparently, the X-Wing, which was created by Incom, had very similar flight characteristics to the uh, small bush hoppers that Anton Merrick used to fly back on his home planet. I'm guessing what he's talking about is the Incom T-16, which Luke Skywalker was also very familiar with. Another thing that Anton Merrick would do would be to cycle the U-Wing out of escort duty and turn it more into a troop transport. Merrick was a huge supporter of the U-Wing program, and he showed the U-Wing pilots a lot of respect despite the fact that he was an elite starfighter pilot. And not just any elite starfighter pilot, Merrick had over 22,542 flight hours, which is ridiculous, and over 24 confirmed kills. In the modern U.S. Air Force, a pilot will be lucky to get a few thousand hours of flight time throughout their entire career, which can span multiple decades. Merrick had the same amount of hours that you would expect from a very experienced civilian airliner pilot. And remember, he's getting shot at most of the time here. Somehow he survived this entire time. And the general was always busy. When he wasn't running his squadron, he was helping rebel intelligence decipher information on the Empire's TIE line of fighters, including the new TIE Defender. But more importantly, Antok Merrick wasn't just an ace pilot and a great commander. He also truly cared for the men beneath his command, and he showed them his compassion as much as possible. Whenever Merrick would appear over the battlefield, the troops would rally to his cause. His loss on Scarif was a huge blow to the rebellion. Wedge Antilles is, in my opinion, one of the most underrated rebel heroes. The ace pilot from Corellia has a very long list of achievements. He started out the war as one of the top cadets at the elite Imperial Flight School, Sky Strike Academy. Even at that young age, Wedge Antilles had an extremely strong moral compass. He decided to defect from the Empire in 2 BBY after hearing about the massacre of a surrendered crew of a rebel transport near the Tarlov system. Still, Wedge was a smart individual and he would stay within the Academy long enough to get a terrific education before leaving. Say all you want about the Empire, they knew how to train pilots better than almost any faction in Star Wars history. It was former Imperial pilots like Wedge and Tilly's who formed the backbone of the new Rebel Alliance Starfighter Corps. In those days, most of the squadrons were made up of bush pilots. Someone as well trained as Wedge and Tilly's, even if he was just a cadet, gave an instant boost in experience and skills to a Rebel unit. Wedge would become famous for his lectures about trigger discipline, which apparently was like a huge problem amongst the Rebel Starfighter Corps. He would also be involved in almost every major battle during the Galactic Civil War. This guy was everywhere. This included the Battle of Atalon, the Battle of Scarif, the Battle of Yavin, the Battle of Hoth, the Battle of Endor, the Liberation of Kaishik, and finally, the Battle of Jakku. Heck, this guy even came back out of retirement to fight against the First Order and the Eternal Sith, and was seen in one of the turret guns of the Millennium Falcon during the Battle of Exegol. And then in Legends, Wedge and Tilly's would go on to fight uh, for the New Republic against many other different factions, including the extra-galactic Yuzang Vong. He also apparently had well over 200 confirmed kills, and one of those kills was the second Death Star. 
Now, as the most decorated and talented starfighter pilot in the entire Rebel Alliance, Wedge and Tilly's actually had a lot of opportunities to move up in the chain of command. And while his abrasive and tell no lies nature and tendency to operate unsanctioned missions and squadrons made him unpopular with the political elite that ran the military, that still doesn't explain why Wedge and Tilly's never rose above the rank of captain. I mean, he clearly had enough combat experience to be a rear admiral. Well, it turns out that Wedge and Tilly's was promoted to a higher rank several times, but he actually refused to accept those promotions because he wanted to stay in the cockpit of his X-Wing or whatever bird he was flying at the moment. Wedge and Tilly's had no desire to be a rear admiral, but he was actually a terrific flight instructor. He would go on to teach many of the Resistance's best fighters, including Poe Dameron. Commander, we heard you're looking for some good pilots. Indeed we are. Welcome to the Rebellion. Saw Guerrero was never really an official member of the Rebel Alliance. One could argue that he was loosely associated with the Alliance to restore the Republic, though. His partisan unit, which we've mentioned on multiple occasions, had a very different ideology and goal compared to the mainstream rebel movement. Saw Guerrero wanted to strike against the Empire and strike hard in every opportunity. He was concerned solely with tactical victories, which he believed could open strategic weaknesses in the Imperial armor. He was also known for executing wounded Imperial soldiers and also targeting Imperial citizens. But what do you expect of a man who's been fighting an asymmetrical battle against various factions since the Clone Wars started? Saw Guerrero's body was scarred and his view of the world was quite radical and extreme, which is why the wider rebellion rejected the partisans. But one cannot argue with Saw Guerrero's abilities as a leader of a guerrilla movement. The difference between us, Ezra, is this. I will do whatever is required to be the victim. The Empire feared Saw's partisans more than any other rebel unit, and that was because they followed no code, no regulation, and they were focused only on killing as many Imperials as possible. So Aguerrero's partisans would be one of the first rebel units to aid the Wookiees in their resistance against the Empire. His many attacks against the Imperial Kyber Crystal supply chain would severely delay the construction of the Death Star project. He even managed to uncover the Empire's genocide of the Geonosians. But by the end of his life, Saw Guerrero was probably too close to the front lines to see that the Empire was slowly closing in around him and his men. Which was fine though, because old warriors like Saw Guerrero welcomed their death without fear or hesitation. One could argue that he was tired of fighting anyway. You can either adapt and survive, or die with the past. The decision is yours. Harrison Dula comes from rebel royalty, and by royalty I mean a long line of resistance fighters, starting off with her father Cham Sandula, who fought against the separate destroyed army, clone army, and also the Galactic Empire. And Harrison Dula was a lot like her father, which is kind of funny because she would actually rebel against him and leave the Twilight Resistance movement and join the mainstream rebel movement. Most of us know Harrison Dula from her time as commander of the Spectres. This was a small resistance cell based out of Lafal, and they were extremely successful at tying up a mass amount of Imperial resources on the planet. Under her command and with the help of Phoenix Cell, the Lothal resistance movement was able to kill the Grand Inquisitor, take out Tarkin's flagship, derail the Tide Defender program, and eventually they even destroyed the Seventh Fleet, and more importantly, disappeared Grand Admiral Thrawn to the Unknown Region. He was probably one of the most dangerous individuals within the Empire, and he presented a true threat to the Rebel Alliance. And she did all of that before the Battle of Yavin even started. Oh, and I also have to mention the fact that she was an exceptionally skilled pilot, like Wedge and Tilly's level. As a matter of fact, she was Wedge's commanding officer on many occasions, and he even taught him some of her tricks. Unlike Wedge and Tilly's, though, Harrison Dula would eventually rise up in the Rebel ranks. After serving during the Battle of Scarif, Harrison Dula would be promoted to the rank of General and be given command of the Lucre Hulk battleship, Lucre Hulk Prime. She would set up a flight school there to train the future pilots of the Rebellion. Once the school is more or less operational, Harrison Dula would get involved in more Rebel operations. After the Battle of Endor, she would be placed in charge of Bomber Battle Group. She would use another Clone Wars era vessel, an Acclimator class assault ship named the Lodestar, as her flagship. This acclimator would actually be converted into a starfighter carrier. The Lodestar would be sent after the feared 204th Imperial Fighter Wing, which had a central role in Operation Cinder. Harris Syndulla would also play a big part in protecting the Starhawk program. This was a new Republic battleship designed specifically to counter the Imperial-class Star Destroyer. 
Paris Syndulla's record during the Galactic Civil War makes her easily one of the most impressive officers of the war. I am not wasting my life. I help people. I lead ships into battle. I am part of something bigger. Anti Merrick basically liked everyone, but he did have a little bit of beef with one individual, and that was Davids Draven. His main complaint about Draven was the fact that he often failed to take into account the human elements of many of the Rebel operations. But that was because Davids Draven was in charge of the Rebel Alliance's intelligence services. He actually originally served in the Galactic Republic's military intelligence, but soon after the New Order was created, he would basically defect to the Rebel Alliance. It was before there was even a Rebel Alliance, actually, so it would be the Alliance to restore the Republic. Military intelligence is all about clearing up the fog of war and then using what knowledge you have to aid the military's actions or the intelligence service's own direct action forces in their operations. Since the Rebel Alliance was completely outgunned and outnumbered by the Empire, I would argue that Rebel uh, military intelligence was the most important branch within the military. Uh, simply put, the Rebel Alliance could not afford to take a chance on any of their operations. They needed to know that they could get their troops in and out safely with minimal casualties. And that was, of course, Davids Draven's main job. And also, without Davids Draven, there would be no Cassian Andor, who he personally recruited. There would also be no successful retrieval of the Death Star plans, which would deliver the Empire's first massive defeat. Draven alone understood the price the Rebellion had to pay in those early days in order to survive the massive Imperial war machine. Now, Draven wasn't without faults, of course. He ordered Cassian Andor to take out Galen Erso, the Imperial scientist behind the design of the Death Star's main laser. This move would almost alienate rebel operative Jen Erso, who was Galen's daughter. But it's also the type of rational decision that Draven's was famous for. We're up against the clock here, girls, so if there's nothing to talk about, we'll just put you back where we found you. Davis just never got along with Jin, and he didn't trust the former street criminal. Although later on, he would regret not believing in her, of course. Now, anyone who would call Draven's a cowardly spymaster would be proven wrong during the assault on the Mako Ta space docks. During the battle, when Princess Leia and Draven's are cornered by Darth Vader on a starship, Draven's has every opportunity to run and save himself, but instead, General Davids Draven's would attempt to stop Vader and buy time for Princess Leia to escape instead. One of his last words before he engaged Vader was, what I'd give for a flamethrower, which just shows us how smart of an individual he actually was. Jun Sato was the type of commander that the earlier rebellion desperately needed. He wasn't the flashiest commander, he didn't have the piloting skills of Sandula, and he didn't have the strategic knowledge of Admiral Akbar. But what he was good at was getting his unit Phoenix Cell through one battle at a time. In those early days, the rebellion didn't have a main base, and so they were on the run all of the time, and everything was extremely difficult. Even simple tasks like securing fuel for their command ship, Phoenix Home, was extremely difficult to do. The Rebels really didn't have that many resources during this time period, and so Jun Sato would only authorize missions that would bring more manpower or vehicles and ships to the cause, or uh, usually he okayed uh, rescue missions as well. It's because of Sato's command that the Spectres would join the wider rebellion. He also managed to save the Rebel cell known as Iron Squadron from being destroyed. Jun Sato also was somewhat of an escape artist. Whenever he was cornered and trapped, he usually managed to find a way to save his crew first and then himself. And even when Phoenix Home was destroyed by Darth Vader himself, Jun Sato managed to regroup the rebellion and convince them to continue to fight on. It was really Jun Sato's tenacity and courage and refusal to give up that helped Phoenix Cell make it through those very difficult early years. But finally, during the Battle of Atalon, Grand Admiral Thrawn would manage to trap the rebels with two interdictors. Jun Sato would make the greatest sacrifice by piloting his command ship Phoenix Nest directly into one of the Imperial interdictors. This would open up a hyperspace lane for Rebel Ezra Bridger to escape and call for reinforcements, which would eventually allow the rest of General Dodonna's fleet to escape from Atalon. If you take a look at how Jun Sato named his command ships, Phoenix Home and Phoenix Nest, it shows us a man who always understood that war was about the soldiers and sailors that fought beside you. It wasn't about the ships, it wasn't about the territory, it was about keeping his men alive long enough so that they could actually inspire the wider galaxy to rebel. He was a very important figure in the early rebellion. And now you know, Admiral, until we meet again. Yes, until we meet again.
When it comes to Mon Cali heroes, younger generations might only know the bold and impulsive Admiral Radis, who died as a hero on Scarif. But the original Mon Cala badass slash commander was the salty fishman known as Gal Akbar. Akbar had served as the captain of the King's Guard on Mon Cala during the Clone Wars. He had defended his planet from the Separatists and Korans during his planet civil war, and like many leaders on this list, he would continue to oppose the Empire when it transitioned from the Galactic Republic. Like Radish, Akbar would eventually escape his home planet and bring along with him several MC-80 cruisers. After King Lee Char died and asked his people to join the Rebel Alliance, it was Admiral Akbar that led the Rebel Alliance fleet in support of the Mon Cala mutineers. Without his decisive action, the Rebel Alliance would have never gained the Mon Cala cruisers that would become the backbone of their fleet. Unlike the other Rebel commanders that we've mentioned on this list, Admiral Akbar was really one of the few individuals in the Rebel High Command who had the experience and skill to command larger fleets. He also had an uncanny ability to detect traps, apparently. It's a trap! When the Rebel Alliance finally grew large enough in size to challenge the Imperial fleet in conventional battles, it would be Admiral Akbar who would take command and lead the rally to victory at decisive battles like Endor and Jakku. Admiral Akbar was a permanent student and also a master of warfare. He would be responsible for constantly upgrading and reforming the Rebel Alliance as it evolved from a guerrilla movement into a full-fledged military force. I mean, people oftentimes underestimate how big of an undertaking this was. The Rebel Alliance started off the war as just a handful of fighters, but by the end of the Galactic Civil War, the New Republic Navy was several times larger than even the Galactic Empires. Proximity alert! It's a trap! Princess General Senator Leia. A lot of people laugh when I call her that, but she really was an individual who deserved multiple titles. While Luke was great at swinging his sword around with his father and piloting an X-Wing, he was always more of a weapon that needed guidance, especially in those early years of the war. It was actually Leia who really helped keep the Rebel Alliance alive and running smoothly. In those early days, the Rebellion was basically just her father, Bail Organa, and her running supplies and setting up weapon stockpiles across the galaxy while using their diplomatic status as cover. As a royal Alderanian, it was a huge deal when Leia joined the Rebel Alliance. She was a charismatic and beautiful individual, and she inspired the Rebels far more than a bunch of Mon Cala cruisers ever could. Davit Stravins knew exactly what he was doing when he gave his life to defend hers. The Princess was also an excellent general. She fought from the front lines and led the Rebels in several different conventional battles like the Defense of Naboo during Operation Cinder, and many special operations like the Battle of Rogas Vas, where the Rebels attempted to kill Darth Vader. She also led a small unit to rescue Rebel General Han Solo from the gangster known as Jabba the Hutt. The only reason we don't think about Princess Leia as a general was because she was famous for so many other things, but she was truly a very competent and disciplined officer. You stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder! Jando Dano was a kindly old looking man who might not seem like much of a military officer at first glance, but he was actually one of the most important founding members of the Rebel Alliance military force. He had served as a bridge officer on a Venator class Star Destroyer during the Clone Wars, and he would actually be one of the first captains of an Imperial class Star Destroyer, but shortly after that, he would actually defect to the Alliance to restore the Republic. By 5 BBY, General Jan Dodana was in command of the Masasi Group, one of the largest rebel fleets during this era. Dodana was known for being calm and wise, even when placed under great stress. He would keep calm when the Death Star approached the main rebel base on Yavin 4 and would be the one who would devise the plan to strike the Death Star using the station schematics delivered by Rogue One. This day has been a long time coming. Hopefully we can finally deal a blow to the Empire and show the rest of the galaxy what we're capable of. Lastly, we have the smuggler Han Solo, former Imperial cadet and mud trooper, and apparently everyone's favorite rogue also happened to be a reluctant hero. When the galaxy needed him the most, like when Luke was making that trench run on the Death Star, Han Solo showed up. And to everyone's disbelief, including his own, he would eventually reach the rank of General and be appointed a unit of Pathfinders during the Battle of Endor. Their mission was not easy. Han Solo had to infiltrate a heavily guarded planet and take out the planetary shield generator that guarded the entire second Death Star. 
and Special Forces Platoon was completely outnumbered by the 501st Legion. But luckily, Han was able to broker a alliance with the native cannibals there and gathered sufficient amount of manpower to take on the Imperial forces. Without his quick thinking and leadership skills, Admiral Akbar's fleet over the forest moon would have been picked apart while waiting for the battle station's shields to come down. Han Solo would go on serving the New Republic, although he would usually create his own independent chain of command and create his own proxy forces to fight with. When his friend Chewbacca needed his help, he would actually assemble a small ragtag team of mercenaries and smugglers and friends to aid the Wookiee in the liberation of his home planet. Han Solo was not only a very capable leader, but he was also a true rebel to the core. You know, sometimes I amaze even myself. So there you have it, guys. Those are 10 extremely competent individuals within the Rebel Alliance. Uh, let me know in the comments section below if I've missed your favorite. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification down there so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.